in light of your goodness, Lord, that goodness would just continue to, to work itself out of our lives, Lord, and uh, that we continue to live this life of faith. And so, my Lord, I pray, please, as we walk through your word, that you would work in our hearts, Lord, that this wouldn't be a Bible study, but that we'd hear from our Father. And so I pray, Lord, as you speak to us corporately, take us as individuals and place us on your lap and, and speak into our ears as a good dad does his children. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You know, there's a story of a pastor who had an intense disagreement with the church council regarding policies and procedures, but especially regarding how finances were being handled by the board. And after some bitter arguments and sleepless nights, the pastor decided to hand in his resignation and, and take a job then as a prison chaplain. On his last Sunday in the pulpit, it's reported that he preached from John 14, verse 1, I go to prepare a place for you. <laughs> Yeah, you know, harmony is a difficult thing in the church, isn't it? We're called to it, but it's not an immediate process, and, and things pop up, and, and sometimes disputes and arguments arise, you know. When we began First Peter, we really looked at the theme of hope in the first 12 verses of chapter 1, where we read there, of course, that we were chosen by the Father and sanctified by the Spirit and cleansed by the Son, and and even though there are trials that we go through in this life, the trials are only for a little while. They're on an as-needed basis. They refine our faith, and there is a day when they're going to end. Amen? Amen? And that's great hope, isn't it? And then the last time we were here in First Peter, we looked at this issue of holiness. When we consider this great privileged time that we live in, right, this privilege where that the this time where that the Old Testament prophets really wanted to look into, and the angels even stooped down to. You understand, we live in a privileged time. It doesn't always feel it, but in God's economy, it is. And in light of that privilege, then, we then begin to look at how we should live. In fact, verse 13 is where First Peter makes the turn. He, he, he describes our privilege in the first 12 verses of the letter, and then from then on, it's all about how we then live as privileged people. And so, we looked at our hope in the first 12 verses. We looked at walking in holiness in verses 13 to 21 of this first chapter. Remember, Peter said, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That is, gather your thoughts, think rightly. And in light of that, you can rest your hope in the coming of Jesus Christ. I'm convinced Jesus Christ is coming. I'm convinced He's coming soon because I just see it. I, I, I don't see it with my eyes, but in my heart, man, wow. And my hope is there. I used to hope in things like politics and, you know, uh, success and fame, but politics isn't cutting it and success and fame never exactly arrived either. Amen? <laughs> But Jesus Christ is coming, and I rest my hope there. And every morning my heart cries out, Oh, Lord, come quickly. And I know yours does too. And so having looked at hope and holiness, now as we pick up at verse 22, we begin to look at this issue of harmony. So verse 22, we're exhorted to love one another. He says, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. He says, since you have purified your souls. Now, the Bible isn't crediting us with the ability to purify our souls. I think we've all tried that. We usually try that on the 1st of January every year. It doesn't last very long, amen? It's more of a figure of speech, but we do believe in what God has done, and therefore we are cleansed. We understand that, right? He says, since you have purified, that's one word in Greek, hagnizo, and it speaks of a ceremonial or a moral cleansing. The word itself is in a perfect tense. 
That is, it's completed once and for all, but it's also a participle, and so it has this idea of having a continuing effect. Therefore, since you've been cleansed once and for all, the inference there is that there's a continual status that goes with it. And also, by the way, it's in the plural and not in the singular. So Peter is writing to the church as a whole, the people of God, and he's reminding them that they've been purified once and for all and that they need to continue in that purity. Now, in the ceremonial sense, we have been purified positionally. You remember when the Old Testament priests would sprinkle blood on, on various articles. It, it didn't change anything. There was nothing that changed in the molecular structure of the brazen altar or the tabernacle or the priests or anything contained therein. But it was a ceremonial, a positional kind of cleansing. Having come to, to faith in Jesus Christ, you understand that you've been purified. Heaven has no rap sheet on you. I, I hope you can just grab the, the, the profundity of that that any record that you had was expunged. So when you stand before your Lord and Savior one day, you're going to be rewarded. That's your judgment. All the junk will be burned away. There's no record of it. You don't have to worry about the slow motion replay when you stand in heaven so all the angels could see every secret sin and every miserable thing that you did and all the things that you regret. You understand when you step into eternity one day, there's no record of your wrongs. The former things have passed away. Ha. But it's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not a work that you can ever do in your own life. It's a work of the Spirit that's done when we obey the truth. That is, when we came to faith, when we believed the Word of God. You understand the Word? The Word doesn't think as highly of you as you think of you. In fact, if we just believed what the Bible said about us, we would not be as disappointed in ourselves as we usually are. But when you come into agreement with the Bible, which says that your righteousness is like filthy rags, and there's none righteous, no, not one, well, then He cleanses you, you see. When you believe that Jesus Christ died on that cross for you, that He was raised from the dead, you come into agreement with the Scripture. You're cleansed positionally before God, and you remain in that state. Practically, that's a different thing. We understand that. But even the practical will become positional, not this side of heaven, but the day we stand before Him. Psalm 119, verse 9, you know it well. David says, how can a young man cleanse his way? And then he answers it, by taking heed according to your word. By God's Word. How does a, a young man cleanse his way, keep his way pure? By spending his time here in God's Word. He says, in obeying the truth through the Spirit. The truth, as I mentioned, is God's Word. When we come into agreement with the Bible, you understand the Bible doesn't necessarily come into agreement with you. The Bible's position doesn't change. Your position needs to change. God's Word is God's Word. It's always going to be God's Word. But when we obey the truth through the Spirit, I just want to make this point that as it relates to the Christian life, both are necessary, God's Word and the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I, I got saved in a church. It was all about the Holy Spirit. And anything that looked interesting, that, that appealed to the carnal, my carnal nature. Well, that was called of the Holy Spirit. And people were barking like dogs and just acting like insane, out of control. And, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. I don't know, uh, uh, fruits of the Spirit, self-control. Nah, it doesn't seem to fit. But we weren't well grounded in God's Word. I've been to a lot of churches that are, are very well grounded in God's Word, but there's no Spirit. You know, in the words of E.M. Bounds, they, they're they're sowing pearls in a sense, you know. Pearls don't have a reproductive power, right? You sow seed, you don't sow pearls. They're great nuggets of truth, yeah, but without the power of the Spirit, well, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, right? Both are necessary components 
components in the efficacy of our salvation. It is by God's word and is through his spirit. And then he's, Peter writes this, insincere love of the brethren. Now, this is not being presented in a causative sense. He's not saying essentially here, let me think this through a little bit. He's not saying since you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, Sincerely love one another. That's not what he's saying yet. What he's saying here is more of a state of being that you've been saved into a sincere love of the brethren. Does that make sense to you? It, this is one of the things I had to struggle with this week because the language doesn't just roll off the tongue. This is where I really appreciate an, an amplified Bible or something like that. But Peter here is... is, is qualifying this, since this uh, sincere love of the brethren with the salvation. When you got saved, you also got saved into a sincere love for the brethren. You got saved into God's family. You understand when you came to faith that you got adopted? <laughs> if you've ever grown up maybe in a foster situation or you know, something like that. You know, everybody hopes that your real dad will come one day and he's rich and wealthy and he's going to take you back into his house. For you believers, that's happened. You've been adopted in his family, but with, with that also comes a sincere love of the brethren. Warren Wiersbe said this, it's impossible to love God and hate the brethren. And it's absolutely true. Now, admittedly, not every family member gets along with others, right? You know, you get a bunch of sheep into a paddock and there's going to be some head butting and, 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 and some nipping and, you know, uh, not that sheep should bite, but they do, you know. And some of you might be thinking, well, I don't love these people. I just, can I just encourage you, just look around for a minute. Because I want to make a couple of, of observations here. Number one, none of you said, boy, when I grow up, I want to move to Minot, North Dakota. <laughs> Let's just state that. Either you moved here because the military moved you here or because you needed the work, or you were born here, but even that wasn't your choice. <laughs> right? I, I, I see an incredibly diverse group of people from all different walks of life. Some of you have southern accents. Some of you are from California and don't have an accent at all. Uh, some of you speak that perfect dialect called Bostonian. I appreciate you very much. <laughs> and yet, I'm blessed every Sunday. I come here and I see the people love each other. I see you hanging out. I see you talking. I stand here at the pulpit ready to preach and you're still out there talking. And I wait and I say, hey, okay, gang, and you're still talking. And I, 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 but man, it's a great sign. I want you to know that. I'm not complaining. I love that. And if you've been saved, then you've been saved into that same dynamic. And if you're not loving the people, it's not because the love isn't there. It's because you've trumped it with an affection for lesser things. If you can look around at these people and say, oh, I don't love them and I don't care about them, it's because there's some other thing in your life, a lesser thing, that you've set your affections on. And your individualism has trumped your love for God's people. And, and if you are highly individualistic, I have some good news and bad news for you, and it's the same piece of news. It's all going to burn. Whatever individualistic attitude you have towards certain things in your life, I can guarantee you it's going to burn. Amen? But this family is forever. Now then, in light of the eternal hope that we have, and the holy lives God has called us to live, and the love that exists within His family, love one another fervently with a pure heart. See, now comes the causative effect. Peter makes the point you've been saved into this dynamic that also includes a sincere love for the brethren. Now he says, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Now it's interesting because when he talks about sincere love for the brethren, that's the Greek word Philadelphia, which we understand as brotherly love. But here, when he says to love one another fervently with a pure heart, 
the word love is agapeo, the verb form of the word agape, or that benevolent, charitable kind of love. You see, Philadelphia, that's easy. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Oh, you're a nice person, I'll be a nice person to you. That, that's easy love, isn't it? But agapeo is a love that's exercised, <laughs> whether you feel like it or not. Having been saved into a sincere love for the brethren, let's step it up and love one another fervently with a pure heart. In other words, let's take the positional and let's make it practical. Let's make what is sincere and move it now to the fervent and the pure. Let's move from phileo to agape, from position to action. You see, this here is a call to pour out what's been poured in. Having been loved and adopted into the family of God, let us then love the family of God. And how's that to be done exactly? Well, first he says, fervently. That speaks of purposefulness and effort and intensity. It's like a runner who stretches forward, kind of giving it everything he has in an effort to sort of win his event. He's going all out. Love one another all out. Leave it all on the track. But you see, it's a determination you have to make. It's a choice you have to make. And not only are we to love one another fervently, but with a pure heart. That means with pure motives. Few things upset me more than someone who comes to the church and starts hanging out, and you realize it's because they're looking for business contacts. I've had that happen before. Realtors come in. And not Tim, by the way. Tim's a close friend of ours. We understand that. I'm not talking about Tim Knutson. He's... But I've had others come in and, oh, can I just leave my business cards right here? No, no, why don't you just take them and, you know, that's, that's, not, that's, that's not a pure love. You're, you know, that's, that's networking. I, I get it and it has its place, but its place isn't here. Now, out of love for one another, absolutely, network. But love will always come first. It's always the higher principle. You see, to love with a pure heart means to love for all the right reasons. But it is a choice that needs to be made. I can't say that enough. You know, when I got saved, I got saved in 1991. Uh, and the church that I got saved in, the midweek service was on Tuesday nights. That's when they had their midweek. Uh, but there's a problem with that. See, because back in those days, Tuesday night fights was on USA Network. Right, And that's two hours of Al Albert and Sean O'Grady, you know, calling the shots in Tuesday night fights. How many remember Tuesday night fights? Okay. Yeah, okay. That's awkward. <laughs> and all of a sudden I got saved and I just wanted to be with God's people. But the midweek was when? On Tuesday nights. And, you know, recording it on your VCR wasn't quite the same. Remember? Okay, how many know what a VCR is? Yeah, yeah. Okay, you got it. Yeah. Some of you still got some of them old tapes laying around because they have your wedding on it and you have no other reason to keep it. I understand. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it really wasn't a hard decision to make. When I got saved, I, I fell in love with those people. And I, and I can't say why. Uh, most of them are 20 or 25 years older than Sandy and I. They came from completely different walks of life. The church was 45 minutes away. I didn't know a soul in that little church. But there was an immediate love for them. And I understand what Paul was talking about in Romans 5.5 5 when he says that the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. When I got saved, the love of God was poured into my heart. I didn't get saved and then the love of God get poured into my heart. Maybe sometime later down the road, it was part of the deal. When the Spirit came into my life, God's love was poured in at the same time. Now, how is it then that we can love each other fervently and with a pure heart? Peter now begins to give that answer in verse 23. Having been born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. He says, having been born again, that's key right there. The, the ability to love one another fervently with a pure heart is a function of being born again. It's a function of the new nature. That is the spiritual nature that was born into us. Now, like the word purified in the previous verse, it's a perfect participle as well. And so it's, it's an event that's happened completely and still has a, an ongoing continual effect. And one of those effects then is a love for other believers. Jesus said in John 13, right, verse 35, He says, By this all will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. It's, it's a natural evidence of being in right relationship with God. If you don't love your brothers and your sisters, then you're not in right relationship with God. I know that sounds really harsh, but let me say it again. Right? <laughs> if you don't love your brothers and your sisters, then you're not right relationship with God. There's something in the way. And he says regarding this born again experience, right? John 3, 3, Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God, right? He says, it's not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. Now, this is the third time Peter's used this concept of corruption and incorruption in this first chapter. He talked about our, the incorruptible inheritance we have back in verses 3 and 4. And then he talked about our redemption in verses 18 and, and 19. Now we see it a third time, and it's in reference to God's Word. You see, there were two births in my life. There was the one that happened in October of 1967. It was of corruptible seed. It was my dad's. My heavenly father and my mother. They produced me. They weren't expecting me, but, but it happened just the same. But it was a corruptible seed. I've been corrupted ever since. I wasn't corrupted because of my environment. I was corrupted from the time I was conceived in my mother's womb. That's when everything went wrong. When sperm met egg, this is what you got. I'm sorry. Amen? <laughs> the result, of course, is selfishness. And it's a selfishness that works out on every level, personally, socially, culturally, governmentally. <clears throat> Ultimately, the selfishness of humanity is global in its effect. The problem is the human heart. It's human nature. It's selfish and self-seeking. I am only more convinced of it as often as I look at my face in the mirror, which isn't as often as it used to be, admittedly, but still too often. It's corrupt, that's for sure. But there is another birth, not of the corruptible seed, that is the, the mechanism of human conception, but of incorruptible seed, the mechanism of spiritual animation. Through the Word of God which lives and abides forever. Having come to faith in, in to Christ in 1991, I was born of incorruptible seed. I heard God's Word. It told me what the problem was. I thought the problem was my parents. I thought the problem was my upbringing. I thought was, the problem was my peer group. I thought the problem was the Republicans or the Democrats or the, the Libertarians or fill in the blank. But the Bible said, no, Bill, the problem is you. Oh, cut like a knife. And yet sweet to the soul at the same time. God's Word took root in my heart. My whole life changed. And the incorruptible seed from which I was born again was God's Word. It revealed my sin. It revealed my condemnation. It revealed Christ's atonement. And it, and it revealed the certain hope I have for eternal life. You see, God's Word and the gospel contained therein is eternal in nature. It abides forever. It isn't going away, and it's never going to change. Many people have tried to lay the Bible to rest. 
Many have tried to exterminate it. It continues to outlive its pallbearers. And because I've been born again through an incorruptible seed, therefore I can love fervently and purely. I couldn't do that before. Before 1991, it wasn't a reality in my life. It was the corrupted nature I was seeking my own. I married my wife because she was beautiful, not because I could be something for her because I wanted her to be something for me, right? Even my marriage was based in selfishness. Well, that got awkward, didn't it? <laughs> but in 1991, when Sandy and I came to faith in Jesus Christ, that changed. Now the question isn't, is she the right one for me? It's, can I be the right one for her? Can she be the right one for him, you see? Because I've been born again, I can love sincerely, fervently, and with a pure heart. The inability to do so is, is a product of the old nature, and I guess that's probably the problem here, is that I have an incorruptible new nature, but I'm stuck in a corruptible shell. I'm like the church of Corinth, the church of Christ in Corinth. <laughs> the church existed in two places, right? In Christ and in, or my not, or fill in the blank. That's the challenge of it all. But the reality is that we can love one another fervently with a pure heart because we've been born again, because of the incorruptible seed that's been placed in us, because of the spiritual nature that we've been given. So don't tell me you can't do it. It's not that you can't, it's that you won't. And that's one of the problems we have as people. We take the words weren't and can't and use them synonymously and they're not. Verse 24, because all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and the flower falls away. Verse 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Peter now substantiates the eternality of God's word by quoting from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8. If you look at that, Peter kind of paraphrases it a little bit, but Isaiah's passage reads this way, the voice said, cry out, and he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the breath of uh, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. See, this is a verse that reminds us of the brevity of life. You know, things like grass, I mean, we're all hoping for green grass now that the snow has melted away. It still looks terrible out there, but you're anticipating. Some of you are even just like, I can hardly wait to get out of church so I can go into the shed, I can get the rake, and I can start raking this mess up because then maybe I'll have green grass and, right? I'm just saying what you're thinking. That's all I'm doing. And, and grass and flowers, you know, they have a real beauty, but it's a brief beauty. The flowers, they pop up. You know, I, I think about the Anza Borrego Desert in Southern California, you know, when the flowers pop up in Anza Borrego, it's amazing. amazing. It's a desert that suddenly just, you know, it, it looks like Oz out there. But, you know, the sun comes up and the flowers are gone and everything dries out and it's all barren again. And the grass, same thing. You're going to spend lots of money at Menards today after church. Those of you who aren't raking are going to Menards. And you're going to go to the nursery aisle and you're going to buy all your, right, your, your fertilizer to get that nice green grass. But, you know, July, August is going to hit. And even in Minot, the grass burns, doesn't it? It's the brevity of life. It, it, you know, uh, things come and go, even people, right? In, in this carnal nature, we come and we go. It's all a part of the follow from the Garden of Eden. And because we're corrupt, everything we do is susceptible to corruption. It's inevitable. All that man has built over time. I mean, most of the, uh, the great monuments of the past are gone, right? 
the ancient wonders of the world. I think other than maybe the Great Pyramid, I think all the rest are gone. They've fallen apart. Anything man makes is subject to entropy. How about man's governmental systems? They all fail over time. That's one of the great lessons of the scriptures and of history, that every form of government ultimately fails if it's human government. Democracies, republics, oligarchies, dictatorships, monarchies, fascist, socialist, or communistic systems, whatever they are, they always fall apart. But God's word, what? Stands forever. Why? Because it's incorruptible. It stands apart from all of this world. So now, if God's word is eternal, and because we've been born again through it, then we are obligated to live by it, and we're also empowered to do the things it calls us to do. And that involves the two great commandments. Now, most of you know, the Old Testament contains 613 commandments. Thankfully, Moses codified them down to, 12, down to 10, the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, oh, I'm looking at these future generations, specifically the people in my not. Let's just take it down to two. He summarizes it into two, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you see. verse 25 continuing on now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you that eternal word that incorruptible word is the word that through which you heard the gospel through which you were born again and now you are empowered then to love one another fervently with a pure heart now we move on to chapter 2 Peter begins, therefore, we'll stop there just a sec, therefore is a, a causation, those of you in the inductive Bible study class, you can't even read the Bible now without keying on those specific words, right? All right, it's a causation, right? The cause is this, in light of the glory in the eternality of God's word as described by Peter and substantiated by Isaiah chapter 40 verses 6 to 8, the effect is that we lay aside certain things, things that are not uh, in line with God's Word, things that are contradictory to God's Word, right? If we're going to love one another fervently and with a pure heart, then there are certain things that simply need to be laid aside. He says, therefore, lay aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking. Now, the word laying aside, or the words laying aside is epotithemi in Greek, and it means to put away, to cast off, to lay aside, put down, put away, or take off. The picture that the word brings to mind is like taking off a dirty garment. Now, if you're, imagine it's 12 weeks from now. You're out there, church is over, you've gone home, you've had lunch, and now you're mowing your beautiful grass. <laughs> and your t-shirt gets nasty. It's full of sweat. It's beginning to stink. You don't, when you don't get in the house, take a shower, you know, you take that shirt off and like, put it in the drawer to wear for later, do you? you? You take it off and you, most of you try to throw it to the hamper. If you're, a teenage, if you're a teenage boy, you don't. You take off those gnarly socks and you just leave them laying around, but you know. But the idea is, is to take something off and to cast it away. It's not just to take it off. It's to take it off and throw it aside. And so, that, therefore, if we're going to love one another fervently with a pure heart, there's just some things you and I have to let go of. Amen? Among them is all malice. How much malice? That means don't hold on to any. All right? All malice. Now, what's malice? Malice is a, it's an extreme attitude of unforgiveness that harbors grudges and ill will against others. It is really the antithesis of love. Now, the word for, used here for malice can also describe just wickedness and evil in general. And some commentators take it that way. Almost exclusively in the New Testament, however, it's, it's uh, translated as malice. But if you consider 1 Corinthians 13, 
in mind, you understand that malice doesn't fit. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, I'm going to read it to you from the NIV first. It says, love is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. In the New American Standard, love does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, it does not take into account a wrong. On, on those texts, they, they see that accounting sort of mentality here of, of, of holding debts, holding grudges, of spending too much time on the wrong side of the T chart or the T account. And here we're told to lay it all aside. If you've got a grudge, and you've got a chip on your shoulder, you've got something against somebody, another believer, throw it away. Flick it off. Take it off. Throw it out. It just doesn't belong. You think, well, they really hurt me. Well, let me remind you of your offense to God and what God was willing to set aside to adopt you as His son or His daughter. In light of that, could you pay it forward and do the same for a brother or a sister? Yeah, they're messed up. So are you. So am I. But why don't we live in light of what they are going to be on that day that we all stand before Him rather than how they stand before us in the here and now. God is determined to view you that way. We've got to determine to view each other that way too. He says, lay aside all malice. He also says, all deceit. Now, here the word is understood as deceit in, in the sense of baiting somebody. You know, some of you today will go fishing. And you'll get yourself a hook and you'll, you'll run a red wiggler or something over that hook, and you're going to disguise that hook, right? It's a piece of sharp steel, but you're going to put a beautiful, gorgeous, tasty worm on it. So you can take advantage of a scaly creature down at the tail race or Grano Bridge, right? You're baiting, right? You're, you're, you're presenting something as though it isn't so that you can take advantage of something that's there. That's, that's the idea here. But that deceit can come in several forms, little white lies. Exaggerations, oh, exaggerations are tough, especially because we tend to exaggerate our, our, our negative observations about other people. <laughs> it comes in the form of flattery, fraud, cheating. There's a host of family members in the, in the, in the deceit family, amen? Throw them all out. And remember this, that when you speak the truth, you have a lot less to remember something I raised my kids with. Listen, tell the truth, you'll have a lot less to remember. They didn't listen to me. But I can guarantee you they'll teach their kids the same thing. Not only are we to lay aside malice and deceit, but also hypocrisy. Right? Most of you know that that, that phraseology comes out of out of the thespian world, especially the ancient plays of, of Greece, where you had one actor who played all the roles. And so there was a series of masks, and so he'd, he'd play one role, he'd put one mask on his face. It was at, in the 80s, it was actually um, common for people, like one of the, uh, rather than put scriptures on the walls, like we all do as Christians now, you had sort of the sad face and the happy face. You know, yeah, what do you call those things? They, they were, I always thought they were kind of creepy, but people did it, you know. And so, you know, the, the, the actor would wear one face and recite his lines and play his role, and then he'd put on the other one, the, and he would, those roles. One actor who played multiple parts. And so we understand what hypocrisy is. It's, it's acting in a feigned part or to give a false appearance. That's the idea. Out of that come certain figures of speech, even in English today, including being two-faced or speaking out of both sides of your mouth. These all go back to that picture of the thespian world. And the idea then is not to live duplicit duplicitously. Be real in your faith. Don't put on a facade. Be real, not just in your faith, but even in your shortcomings regarding your faith. 
There's no reason why we can't come in here. Hey, how are you doing, bro? Oh, dude, man, I'm really struggling. There's no reason we can't do that. Everybody here is struggling, amen? That's, that's part of living in this life. Paul, uh, Peter makes it pretty plain here in the, in the previous verses in chapter 1. But so often we're, we just want to present ourselves in the best possible light and we want to be cool and our churches have become superficial and image-based. I don't want to be image-based. I don't even want to be cool. I never was. 55 years I've never been cool. But I'll tell you what, my Lord's teaching me to be authentic. Being cool, that's a, that's a man-centered thing. But true authenticity as a believer is a legitimate work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to be. I don't need mirrors and smoke and... No, I just God's Word and let's just be real. But no, no, no. We want to present ourselves to the world like we're just like them. Because if we're like them, we look like them, then they'll like us. And if they like us, then they'll listen to us. When this world is hurting, it doesn't go looking for people that looks like it. It's looking for authenticity. Why is your life different? I see you struggle, but you still have hope. How is it you can keep moving on? I, I, you've buried your children. You've gone through horrible things. How is it you can keep going on? That's what they're looking for. They're looking for hope. Not for hair gel. Amen? <laughs> I used to wear that, but I don't need it now. Just being real, right? So don't live duplicitously. That's all, right? He says also envy. Thonos in Greek, right? It's an attitude of discontent or resentment upon hearing of the success, the fortunes, or the advantages of other people. Envy is when the guy next to you gets the job and you get resentful over it. Envy is a tough one because it comes from deep within, doesn't it? It comes right out of the core of who we are. There's a story that Dwight Moody used to tell. It was about an eagle who was very envious of another eagle that could fly higher than he could. And one day the, uh, that eagle saw an archer as he was walking around on the ground and, and he said to the archer, you know, I'd really like if you would just shoot that eagle down out of the air. And the, and the archer looked at the eagle on the ground and said, well, I don't have any feathers for my arrows. So the eagle pulls a feather out and the archer quickly, you know, gets it onto his, he fletches it onto his shaft, you know. And he lets that arrow go and he misses. A little while later, that Eagle comes flying back the other way and, oh, get him now. Here's another. Did that half a dozen times. And then the archer turned around and killed the eagle on the ground because he couldn't fly away. And that's kind of like what envy, envy's like. You, you, you actually resent people to your own hurt. And envy will take you apart a piece at a time. I, yeah, I'll be honest with you. I, people here, I, I left a career, obviously, to go into the ministry. But I hear about people being... Uh, you know, being promoted in their jobs or, you know, doing really well financially. And there's that initial part of me is like, oh, that could have been me, you know. It happens sometimes. Now I'm learning now. I'll just be happy for them. God's blessed them. What could be better than that? Amen. Also, we're to take off all evil speaking. The word katalalia in, in Greek refers to gossip, defamation, backbiting, malicious gossip, these kind of things. He says, get rid of all of that too. Just don't take it off. Take it off and throw it away. You know, gossip is really nothing more than slinging mud at other people in an effort to make yourself look better than them. It's not making you any better. You're just trying to make them worse. I, I, I read a, a quote I, I thought was incredibly insightful. It was something like this. If you tell a bit of gossip and people don't believe you, just whisper it. Because that's the propensity of the human heart. If we'll whisper it for some reason, oh, tell me more. 
But all, all of these things, they're attitudes and actions that are violations of that second great commandment. They're products of the corruptible seed, not the incorruptible. They're the old nature, not the new nature. With our salvation came a love for God's people. And so if we're going to love them fervently and purely, then we have to lay these five things aside. But that's a decision that you have to make. Sometimes we think like, oh, it's just fatalistic, you know, I just hang out at church and I just get better. No, you've got to make some decisions, you've got to take some action, and God will bless that. But you've got to make the decision. So then take off the soiled clothing of the old nature, put on that which is incorruptible. Now, let me also say this though, these five uh, items that Peter has put here in verse 1 are not exhaustive. You can go through the, through the New Testament. Uh, you can see them in, in general form in Romans 13, 12, uh, Ephesians 4, 22, Hebrews 12, 1, and James 1, 21. Then you can see some specifics in Colossians 3, 8 as well. But understand then that we've been empowered to love one another sincerely, fervently, with a pure heart. We've also heard the call to decisively repent of various sins that hinder that call. And now we move on to the third call of action here in verses 2 and 3, and that's too long for God's Word. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. Interesting now, the illustration is moved from seed to milk. The word desire here in Greek is epipotheo. It means to intensively crave possession. It, it, it speaks of earnest desire or to long after something. So having been determined to get rid of five things, we're told what we ought to be longing for now. That is, get rid of the, of the sinful attitudes and actions and have an appetite for the pure Word of God. As newborn babes. You know, as a newborn babe, there's only one thing that satisfies them. When a newborn babe starts crying, you can buy him a new pickup truck. It doesn't matter. He's still going to cry. You can tell him how, oh, you're such a good little baby. You're amazing. Waited my whole life for you. He's still going to cry. Amen? There's only one thing that satisfies a newborn babe, and that's his mom. His mom's feeding him. You know, this past week, my, my grandkids came over uh, for Easter. They were on my wife, my daughter's in-law's side of the family. And, and so they came over Monday for a leftover Easter dinner. And, uh, and my youngest grandson, Asher, he's a year old, he started crying. And my daughter said, oh, if he cries, just give him a bottle. I took that bottle. Now, he's only a year old. But wow, does that kid have a grip. As soon as it got into his field of view... Wham! He grits, and then he starts chewing on the nipple, like weeping and gnashing of teeth, kind of stuff. And and then, and he starts drawing on that thing. Oh, that we would have an appetite for God's word like that, Amen. To reach out and grab it, and chew on it, and draw from it all that we possibly could. And Peter qualifies God's word as being pure. Dolos in Greek. Interestingly, the Greek word dolos is the word deceit in verse 1. Now here in verse 2, we read pure, which is a dolos or without dolos, without deceit. And, and in the Greek, the idea comes of without additive. One thing about your newborn babes, you don't put Nestle's chocolate syrup in their milk. Amen? You, there's no additives. It's pure. Mom takes the child close to her, baby feeds pure milk. Be careful of additives. You keep God's Word pure. We don't add to it, we don't detract from it. In fact, we're told several times in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 12, Proverbs 30, Revelation 22, do not add or detract from God's Word. Because it's perfectly nutritious the way He's given it to us. Who are we then to mess with that? This is the great fear I have. 
for, for, for certain churches and pastors and a fear I have for myself. I never want to misrepresent God's word. Moses misrepresented God and he got a pretty stiff sentence for it. He couldn't go into the promised land. I don't want to misrepresent God. I just want to give it to you purely the way it's there. And there, there are all kinds of Christian media outlets, right? I mean, there's radio and podcasts. There's printed articles and books. There's YouTube videos and The Chosen, whatever. But listen, it's not as pure as taking God's Word and reading it yourself. And those things are certainly no substitute for God's Word, and I'll tell you why. God most often meets His people in His Word. So he says then, as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. See, having been born again by God's word, continue in that word so that you can continue to grow. When I got saved in 1991, I didn't get saved like, wow, there's Bill in the perfected form. It was probably the roughest form possible, right? And God has been chipping away for 30 years. I can't believe how much dross I was carrying around. And he'll continue to. But I'm going to stay in God's Word so that I continue to grow. It's loaded with spiritual nutrition. It brings growth. It brings development. It's God's intended diet for you and I. Not Fox News. You need to defox and pick up God's Word. And here's the one thing I, I have learned. Feeding on the pure milk of the Word will whet your appetite for the meat of the Word later when you cut your teeth. You know, that, that's, that little church that saying I got saved in, we spent five years there. I thank God for those years because my pastor, like I said, it was a man of just crazy, rock-solid integrity. I watched people mistreat him, slander him. I watched him serve them, and they treated him like garbage, and he hung in there until God called him to be a missionary. He was a, an, an incredible example of what manhood looks like. One thing he didn't do was teach us a whole lot of God's Word. I still thank God, though, because it whet my appetite for God's Word, and I had to learn to feed myself. And I had to pick up God's Word. I got one of those, um, you know, year, one-year Bibles. Some New Testament, some Old Testament, some Proverbs, some Psalms. And in the course of a year, you read it. And man, that just, that rocked my world. Now, after I got that appetite, then this radio station, some Calvary Chapel group showed up in our, in our area. And I started listening to the radio. But my initial growth wasn't because of radio. And even then, it wasn't, still wasn't because of radio because I never listened to as much as I wanted to. But I could meet God every morning in His Word. And here's what I have noticed, you know. Pastors don't have perfect devotional lives. Can I tell you that? Because I'm being authentic here. No hypocrisy, all right? Sometimes we take a day off. It's really hard if a pastor goes on vacation because his whole schedule gets thrown off and... You're trying to spend time with your family, and, you know, and, you know, and it's easy to connect your devotional life with your work, but it's really not. You know, I, my devotional life is not First Peter. My devotional life was Psalm 84 this morning, interestingly, but whatever. But when I, I'm not in God's Word, if I'm not in it for a day or two or, or three, now that's one good thing about the one-year Bible. If you hate being behind, man, that thing will help keep you forward, but... I get skittish, and, and I get anxious inside. And I'm not an anxious kind of person. I tend to be really rock steady, but if I'm not in God's Word, man, internally I begin to really, I have my squirrel moments, you know. Um, but that appetite that, that was inadvertently fostered in me has served me well to this day. And I pray it serves you well also. There are many things I don't know. In fact, I thought I knew everything, and then I left home. 
And now I've only become aware for the past like 38 years of just how ignorant I am. I've actually, the more I learn, the more ignorant I become. It's a really strange dynamic. But I do know this. I have a, a fairly good handle on God's Word. It's not a complete handle. I'm not pretending that I've arrived. But I've got a pretty good handle on God's Word. And if I'm going to know anything, let me know the best thing. And then Peter closes out in verse 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, the word taste here denotes more than just a sampling. It, it denotes partaking of something. Have you fed on God's word? I mentioned this morning that my devotions were in Psalm 84. And it was like water to my soul. I'm going to read it to you real quick. It's only 12 verses. I know we're running behind. But Psalm 84 goes like this. How lovely is your tabernacle. He says, O Lord of hosts, my soul longs, yes, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and a swallow a nest for herself. Where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they path, pass through the valley of tears, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. I read of God's tabernacle. I read of His courts. I read of His altar. I, I read of His house. And and. and and David just anticipates that. It, it, it sounds simple, and it's as simple as milk, but it, 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 it gives me nutrition. It, it sets my, my priorities straight. What do you long for? That Bill would hurry up and finish the sermon? I long for that too. Nevertheless, I long for... <laughs> I long for His presence. I long for eternity. I got a job to do in the meantime. Amen? Verse 8 in Psalm 84, he says, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. He says, O God, behold our shield and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tents of wickedness. I love that. And it's so easy to envy certain people for what they have and the success they have and all the free time they have and blah, 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 blah. David says, for all that David had as a king and the wives and the money and all of that stuff, he says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. And then he says in verse 11, for the Lord is a, God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and and glory. No good thing will th he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. Have you tasted of God's word? And if not, what are you, what are you tasting? Are you drawing on the bottle of Fox News or YouTube? Or I'm not saying they don't have their place. I'm just saying, man, God's word first. Amen? God's word primary, because that will feed your soul. That will feed the incorruptible man, not the corruptible one. As I read that psalm, I'm reminded of the transient nature of life, the difficulties that come with it, and the certain I hope, hope I have beyond it, right? Peter here in, in, in verse 3 of chapter 2 is probably quoting Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is is good, right? Amen. Well, we're running late. So, uh, 
in light of the fact that you've been saved into a sincere love for one another, love one another fervently and with a pure heart, lay aside the malice, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the envy, and the evil speaking, and long for God's Word. Amen? You do that, and we'll all continue to grow as His children. All right, well, I don't want to stop, but you have to go to Menards, and you have to rake your yard. Uh, so let's worship our Lord.